spies, lies, and espionage. And it's all on Primetime TV. Hi, I'm Eric Richardson, and this is Cable Talk. Spies, lies, espionage, murder, and betrayal. Thrilling spy dramas like The Americans on FX and Showtime's Homeland have made the world of counterterrorism absolutely must-see TV for millions of viewers. The shows are also winning rave reviews from critics. But what do those who chronicle the intelligence community think about the veracity of the spy craft in this fascinating series of programming? Well, Cable Talk reached out to one of Washington's spy watchers for answers, and he's ready for a debriefing. Jason Werdon heads up the public relations for the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., which features the largest collection of international espionage artifacts ever placed on public display. It's the only public museum in the U.S. solely dedicated to espionage and the events that have shaped history and continues to have a significant impact on world events. Great, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So all of the great programming that you see on Showtime with Homeland and then you have the Americans on FX, what do you think about the programming? Well, I'm an avid follower particularly of the Americans on FX. It's a great program that really details the late end of the Cold War. Uh, I believe it's in 1981 here right in D.C. that the show is set. And it shows a lot of the behind the scenes working that was going on from spies that were right in front of our eyes that we had no idea were here in the states and it's all very true to form uh, you see that in the history of espionage that particularly details the, the cold war and you see how people were hiding in the shadows they were really working in a clandestine nature that you are meant to not know who they are you know either you or i could be one of those covert spies and that's what's so great about the show so, of course, you are a big fan of the Americans, but Homeland has like this cult following. People are yes. like addicted to this. Why do you think they're addicted to this type of program? I think it is because it's so true to form. It could happen in any given day, and that scares people in a way. You have Damian Lewis, who, uh, whose character is the Marine, could or could not be a covert spy against the United States. And Claire Danes' character, who is a bit neurotic herself, is trying to figure that out and trying to determine if it is true or if she's crazy. And it's a blurred line somewhere in between. And I think sometimes it makes us think that we're a bit crazy for thinking that this couldn't happen, when in actuality it does and very well could. Now, President Obama has gone on the record to say he, too, is a fan of Homeland. Yes. What do you think about that and, you know, the President of the United States? That's pretty major. I think that President Obama every day has to deal with some of these very real-life stories. Edward Snowden, for instance, with the former NSA contractor who was recently granted an asylum from Russia. And he has to deal with this in the real world every day. I think he would enjoy taking a break and enjoying the uh, cinematic aspect of it and not just the real world that he has to deal with all the time. So it's a bit therapeutic and almost like a release there. Exactly. <laughs> so social media plays a big part in the success of these shows. Yes. People get online between Twitter and Facebook and they do all of that. When you're watching The Americans, do you tend to be on your social media? Uh, given the nature of even what I do with the International Spy Museum, I do love following it and seeing what people are saying, the conversations they're having while these shows are going on because it really, it adds another level of what is going on within the show and the, that community following that says you know what is going to happen next what do you think of what this character did or that character did it really uh, particularly for us at the museum we love following that along and seeing how what we know about the inner workings of espionage can play into that conversation so of course we know that homeland just kind of did very well at the primetime emmys so how is the americans coming along with response to critics and the industry really embracing it it's been very critically acclaimed it will be starting its second season uh, this fall on fx and actually the creator of the show joe weisberg uh, who has a uh, former career in intelligence within the cia he came to us at the museum about six months ago and we gave him a tour, we showed him around, and so many times you see these programs on TV, uh, and in talking with Joe, it really is life imitating art and art imitating life. He drew from some things that he found in our collection, but also he draws just from 
the inner workings of his own mind and what he knows from working in the CIA to come up with these very elaborate, yet based on actual facts, storylines. So the Spy Museum, of course, is an inspiration in so many different levels. It's, I mean, the most fascinating thing there. Do you guys host events that are related to either, either of these shows? Or? Yes, we actually, right now we have a special exhibition that's dedicated to the James Bond film franchise, looking at the many villains he's faced over the 50 years of this franchise. And uh, it plays along with what you see in shows like The Americans and shows like Homeland. It's more than just what you see on TV. It's what actually occurs in the real world of espionage. And what we try and do is bridge that gap of the public's perception and America's perception of what is working in the shadows of espionage. And so we have programs that detail what you see in these shows and what actually has happened, whether it be in any of the Bond films or within shows like Amer The Americans and Homeland and even uh, on USA, Covert Affairs and, and Burn Notice. So, of course, you know, you get to work on a Monday morning and people talk about things. At the Spy Museum, of course, it's very interesting because I, I could imagine you guys talk about these shows and you say, wow, now that was just unbelievable or that was just so far-fetched. Do you guys have that kind of conversations or do you look at some of this stuff and say, hey, that's just not so? You look at that and we have a banter like that, uh, particularly on the day after the show, and we'll say, exactly what you're saying that was a bit bit far reaching or you know they really hit the nail on the head with how that was portrayed particularly in the americans how it's looking at uh at the cold war and in the early 80s and how such small actions played such a larger role in the cold war so of course the shows have a very unique style to them and I think they, they kind of craft them in a way that you're intrigued, the shooting style and the imagery that you see. Give us a little insight on that. I think every little thing they detail on the show does wrap you in very quickly and it can be done in a very short period of time on the show. When you look at the details of a scene for instance, in the Americans, when uh, a suspect they're going after, they shoot with a, an umbrella a weapon, a concealed weapon in an umbrella. And that's very true to form with what was used in 1978. The KGB used a, an umbrella in the streets of London to shoot a KGB dissident, Georgi Markov. And he died three days later after that occurred. And it was through a little pellet at the tip of a concealed umbrella. And you see it on the show and you realize, okay, that is actually something that did occur. And so when you look at the little nuances of the show, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see those contrasts. We're going to have some more talk about that interesting umbrella and all of these other gadgets. So don't go away. Cable Talk will be right back with more on spies, lies, espionage, and more on Primetime TV. She's willing to sacrifice everything in order to do her job. Car won't start. We have to take the bus to the Metro. Oh, Dad. Yeah. Mary got two goals and assists last night versus LA. Did they win? Welcome back to Cable Talk. I'm Eric Richardson. The folks at Showtime and FX are serving up spies, lies, and espionage in two primetime dramas that have become must-see TV for millions of viewers. But what do the people in the business of watching spies think all about it? From the Spy Museum, Jason, we're going to continue this discussion, I tell you. That sounds great. So, you look at these shows and the characters are very unique and different, kind of true to the kind of spy world. Tell us about some of the character flaws that you see in many of the characters on these shows. When you look at the couple in The Americans, the husband in the show is a bit conflicted. He is true to his KGB roots, to his Russian roots, but he's being a bit Americanized, for lack of a better term, and doesn't know where that his allegiance ends and a new allegiance begins. And then you have his wife in the show, played by Carrie Russell. She is very hard and fast on the lines of this is a job, this is a, a calling that she is performing for the KGB, but living in America as a American housewife and with her husband and their family. They're trying to live the American dream while also trying to destroy it. So it's uh, interesting to see these characters deal with what they're supposed to be doing and the lives that they want to lead regularly. 
So Claire Danes and Carrie Russell, two kind of former teen idols right. are on these shows. So both of them are kind of tough women who could kill you. They are. So, I mean, who's the more, more convincing one to you? I think in forms of what you see on the shows and how it relates to espionage, I gravitate a bit towards Carrie Russell's character. I think that it, as much as I even don't want to say that, because <laughs> she is going after uh, American secrets in the show, but I think she portrays that really well. And you also look at a character like Claire Danes's, and it's very nuanced and uh, has a lot of layers to who this person is and the own troubles in her own life and how it reflects then to what she's trying to do in the workplace as well. And they're both very dynamic, but I think I gravitate a bit more towards Carrie Russell's as far as the world of espionage is concerned. she could kill you. She very well could. <laughs> and in case she's listening, maybe it's better I say that. <laughs> so when you see the characters and the plot lines and all, there's some kind of bloopers there. Are there several that kind of stand out to you that um, you guys talk about or that the internet's been buzzing about? In the Americans, they often show scenes of dead drops. Now, a dead drop is where you go and take a bit of information that you're looking to plant for a second party and put it in a predetermined location. Now, that could be in a fake rock in Rock Creek Park. That could be under a bridge in Upper Northwest. But you look at these shows, and something that I always look for is, are they doing it correctly? Are they dropping the information in a way that a spy would actually do it? And I think Americans, the Americans is doing that very well in portraying how spies actually acted. Now, you watch it sometimes and you say, okay, you know, they're stretching our imagination a little bit for the use of cinematography for an, an audience, which we understand. But if I have to be making a check every time I see something like that, yeah, there are times that I would think it would be done differently in the real world. So you talk about Rock Creek Park, so of course DC plays a big Very part in so. this. So of course, you know, they don't tape in DC, so they have to kind of recreate the scenes <clears throat> and kind of make it the DC that we knew in the 80s yes. during the Cold War era. So how convincing are the scenes, um, the sets, and all of the good things there? You look at some of the, the set pieces that they have, and. Uh, being a native Washingtonian, I look at them sometimes and it's like, ah, that's not DC. Very <laughs> clearly it is not DC. You're not gonna get that angle looking at the Capitol anywhere in the city. But it's done in a, a well enough that you can tell that the characters are in that early 80s, kind of bridging the late 70s aspect, whether it be from the, the wardrobe design, uh, what they're driving, how they're talking, and that part of the thing is done pretty well. So it's more than just the kind of locale, it's the camera work, it's the complete package that they give you. And music plays a big part of that. Absolutely. Both shows have really relied on music. You can hear everything from Miles Davis to Fleetwood Mac. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about the music and how it impacts the show? I think it impacts it a lot. In fact, when you watch the pilot episode of The Americans, towards the end of the episode, there's a bit of a, a promiscuous scene between the lead couple and Phil Collins in the air tonight starts playing and it culminates to that big drum solo in, <laughs> in the air tonight but it, given the, uh, the era in which the show is set and relating it to the music I think it does a good job of putting you in that mindset putting you in that time. So you mentioned couples, you mentioned marriage so when you look at some of this you kinda think wow as a spy, you know, you can't just kind of pick up your family and say, hey, here we go. So uh, there is a scene or there's a plot line where a marriage is arranged. Mm -hmm. Does the Russian government, to your knowledge, sometime kind of make that happen where it's a prearranged marriage and identities are changed? To my knowledge, I can't say that there, it has or has not happened, but I do know that it's not far off and that when you have two spies that need to work together on a central mission, they could be put in any type of situation that is best for the at that outcome. And as we see on the Americans, it's to put two Russian operatives, two KGB operatives, in a marriage, in a home in D.C. where they can infiltrate secrets. And as it turns out, it ends up being a silver lining that they're placed next to uh, an FBI agent 
who is ripe for the picking for information. So of course people have kind of a perception of what a spy would do and how their life would kind of go. You go to the Spy Museum and it's very interactive and technology heavy. So tell us a little bit about the technology at the Spy Museum. You say that, that perception of what a spy would do. Well, if a spy is doing it right, you'll never know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, we try and tell that story at the museum. First putting you, uh, and giving you the opportunity to take on your own cover, your own legend, where you have a new identity that you take through the museum. And you will then go into our school for spies where you're really inundated with all of the, the gadgets, the aspects, the, the interaction that you have as a spy and how to implement them into your own mission. And whether it just be maintaining the surroundings that you have, knowing what to look for, what to say, what not to say, and that, that always someone's always listening. So it really is a matter of understanding what to, what to do and what not to do when you're a spy. And it uh, can be a blurred line at times. It gives you an opportunity to see all the gadgets, all of the spy craft, all the spy fare that we have. But it shouldn't be lost on the visitor that the actual most important thing that a spy will always have on them is their intuition. Technology will fail you. You're, your Minox camera, your essential spy camera won't take the shot or you know, the wire you placed won't get the information, but at the end of the day, you still have your intuition. And it's that aspect that really plays most heavily into essential spy craft. So the Spy Museum is pretty much in the heart of the city. You guys have a line uh, through the summer sometimes and it's always a activity going on there. Tell us about some of the famous people that have been through the Spy Museum. Well, here in D.C., we have more spies per capita in the district than anywhere else in the world. So where better to tell this story of international espionage? And we have people coming from across the world, actors, uh, celebrities, uh, famous dignitaries to come through and want to see this collection of espionage. Uh, two years ago, uh, President Obama and the First Lady did come through with uh, their daughters to see the museum. And given the inner workings as we were discussing of what he does every day, it was a nice break to see the world of espionage in a way that he wasn't having to be working and he could actually just enjoy it. Uh, the show Covert Affairs, it's another espionage show on USA Network. Two of their actors, uh, Peter Gallagher and Chris Gorham, came through just two weeks ago uh, to see the museum while they were in town filming for the show, with it, as it's based in Washington, D.C. as well. And similarly, they wanted to get an opportunity to see what they're doing every day as actors, but how it actually plays into the real world of espionage. Great, so there's a possibility that a former spy, or a spy has been there, but of course you wouldn't know if a spy has been there, but a former spy, is there any relation to that or any story on that? Absolutely, actually, our board of directors and our executive director, Peter Ernest, are all former spies. They're made up of uh, former members of the intelligence community that are the best people to tell this story of the world of international espionage. Uh, Peter Ernest, our executive director, is a 36-year career CIA operations officer. And who better to, to lead a museum on espionage than someone who's been in the field and knows the inner workings of these stories. Two members of our board also include uh, Tony and Jonna Mendez. Uh, you know, Tony's very famous now for Argo, Ben Affleck's mm -hmm. uh, Oscar-winning picture from last year and that true story of a, a mission formed out of a fake movie it seems almost too bit too uh, unreal to be real and uh, that's what's so great about espionage is that anything can stretch the imagination almost to its brink but that's sometimes when it works works best so why should someone stop what they're doing and go down to the spy museum you know we do have the largest collection of artifacts surrounding international espionage on public display and and it's something you're not going to see anywhere else we want to visitors to come in and really immerse themselves in the mission that they have while they're there to uncover anything they can about the world of espionage and in particular right now we have a special exhibition cele celebrating the 50th anniversary of the james bond film franchise it's called exquisitely evil 50 years of bond villains and it details the history of the franchise through the eyes of its villains, from Dr. No in 1962 through Raul Silva as seen in Skyfall last year. And it puts the franchise in a historical context with the real world threats that we've faced over the past 50 years, from the Cuban Missile Crisis through cyber 
warfare and terrorism today. And so visitors have an opportunity to really gauge that, that perception of what spies do and how it plays into not just what they see on the screen, but how it affects their own lives every day. Well, Jason, definitely thank you for stopping by Cable Talk and giving us some insight on the world of espionage. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. You have to come and spy on us sometime. Absolutely. All right. Stay tuned. Cable Talk will be back in a moment. For more information on the D.C. Office of Cable Television and to review your Cable Consumer Bill of Rights, visit our website at OCT.DC.gov. That's it for this edition of Cable Talk. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Eric Richardson, and we hope to see you back next time right here on DCN, the District of Columbia Network. All DC, all the time.